everyone, my name is Nicole Fegan and welcome to my bookshelf and my gourds. So I love watching book collection videos or like bookshelf tour videos, but I don't have like a huge bookshelf where seeing how it's organized would be interesting, um, though if any of you would be interested in that, I'd be happy to take you on a whole tour of my tiny little bookshelf. But in today's video, I'm going to be talking you through my poetry book collection. Um, I love reading poetry and I've especially discovered a love of like reading an actually curated poetry book collection, not just finding poems online or reading like the entire E.E. E. Cummings, but like an actually curated book of poetry that costs like 15 stupid dollars, but it actually is worth it because this very specifically curated thing is so good. Some of these I've read, some of these I haven't read. I just want to talk to you about all of them to maybe give you some recommendations and maybe you can give me some recommendations. Up first we have And the Stars Were Shining by John Ashbery. I found this for like two or three dollars um, at like a used book bin in New York City and I haven't read this yet. Um, I've heard very good things about John Ashbery. I know this is not his most popular book by like a wide margin, at least according to Goodreads. But one of my friends has spoken quite highly of him, um, so this is something I'm very excited to get to. Um, and the poems, I don't know, seem long and naturey, and I like the font of the book. The font of a poetry book matters so much, I don't even know how to tell, like, what to tell you. So yeah, excited to get to this sometime soon. Next we have Sympathetic Little Monster by Cameron Awkward Rich. Um, I read this for a college class on trans literature. Um, Awkward Rich is a black trans man, and these poems are so beautiful. My copy of this book is, like, all written over because I wrote a couple essays about this book um, for that class, and I think what this book reveals is why I love reading like even small little poetry collections, and it's because you're able to follow the themes really closely. The way he uses images of like mouths and trains to talk about his experiences that you're able to follow from poem to poem, it just creates this really like holistic image that is just like so effective. I'm frankly due for a reread of this, but this is some of the best modern poetry I've ever read. Next we have A Crystallography by Christian Bach, and this was a poetry book made for me. So a little bit of background here. My senior year I took this English writing class um, on Gertrude Stein, and our final project for that class was a poetry project you had to write, um, and I kind of really honed in on mathematical poetry, poetry um, that is both about math and about the human interest in math. And the professor, who is the coolest professor I've ever had, she actually, she used to be like a biology student and then she transitioned into writing poetry, so I feel like we were kind of had like similar interests about like the intersection of science and poetry. And she's the one who recommended this book to me. This is a poetry book about like fractals and crystals and formations in like a mathematical chemical way. Yeah, so a lot of these poems are quote unquote studies on crystals, fractals, ruby, glass, um, there is like a whole section on snow and then um, geodes and diamonds, but it's all under this umbrella of the fact that Chris, um, Christian Bach's father was a crystallographer. So this is dealing in some ways with a lot of these mathematical scientific things, but there's also this very personal story weaved throughout this that like really just brings it all together. I haven't really written poetry since I graduated college. I think I might have written one poem, um, but this really inspired me and I feel like if I ever do get back into writing it's going to be something in the guise of this. Um, and I just like, I am so impressed with the way he weaved all of his themes and interests and it's awesome. Next we have the poetry book I think I have owned for the longest and that is A Hundred Select Poems by E.E. E. Cummings. Um, E.E. E. Cummings is one of my favorite poems full stop. I read this for the first time maybe like my freshman year of high school and a lot of these poems have just really stuck with me. Pity This Busy Monster Man Unkind is like the second poem I ever loved after Annabelle Lee. Um, and this also has Since Feeling is First and Oh Sweet Spontaneous and I just feel like if you're looking for an introduction to E.E. E. Cummings or really to poetry because I oddly feel like even though his style is kind of eccentric I feel like E.E. E. Cummings is kind of like a great gateway to poetry. Um, I just cannot recommend this enough. I haven't read a ton of his other stuff to know if like the hundred ones selected for this are really his best but I love it. Next we have The Wasteland and Other Poems by T.S. Eliot. Um, I read The Wasteland for college but not from this book. Barnes & Noble was doing this thing for a while where they had like these what the the Barnes & Noble classics like buy two for five dollars. So this was like one of the ones on the table I was most interested in. Whatever. I have not actually read this book yet. I remember really enjoying The Wasteland. Um, it's obviously like one of the most important poems ever written, um, but there's not really much more I can say about this since I haven't read it yet. Let me know if you like Elliot in the comments below. <laughs> Next we have my favorite poetry book of all time. I've talked about this on this channel before, and that is A Coney Island of the Mind by Lawrence Ferlinghetti. This is about the Coney Island of the Mind and the circus of the soul. Um, this is poetry that is not specifically about Coney Island, though it does have a very like city feel. Feels like it's about life in the city and life 
life at this time period, it feels very 1950s. It feels very beat. Of like the beat literature I've read, this is probably my favorite. Granted, I haven't read a ton. I've read like this and On the Road and maybe some other scattered stuff. There's one long poem in this collection called Junk Man's Obligato that I think might be my favorite poem of all time. It just like moved me like beyond words. Um, and this again feels very cohesive, even though I think it has like poems from like three different collections in this one collection. Um, it's just exceptional. I cannot recommend this enough to people who already read poetry and people who are trying to get into poetry alike. I think it's gotten dark. I'm filming this at what time is it? It's 3.11 and it's getting dark, so I'm very sorry if the lighting is completely fucked up at this point. But next, we have The Carrying by Ada Limone. I literally just read this last month. Um, this is a book about fertility and motherhood and environmentalism and the world changing. Modern poetry gets a bad rep. Um, I too do not like the trend of very very short poems and I feel like because that is so popular it has deterred a lot of people from checking out poetry that has been published in the 2010s or now in the 2020s. But I really enjoyed this. At no point did I think it was too dense or complicated for me and yet the language and the pacing and the flow of these poems was so dynamic um, just in ways that I don't know I feel like there was such a yeah again this negative per, like perception of poetry being written nowadays which I understand but like this was real good. If you're looking to just check out one or two poems from this uh, my favorites are Instructions on Not Giving Up and The Overpass or it might just be called Overpass but um very good poetry would recommend. Then we have maybe my second favorite poetry book of all time, which is also on the more modern side, and that is Bluettes by Maggie Nelson. Maggie Nelson set out to write a book about blue. This is a prose poetry book that I'm sure I've written all over, um, and it is about Maggie Nelson's heartbreak and her endeavor to write conceptually and emotionally about the experience of the color blue. She documents different blue endeavors she tries to have, different blue endeavors she has in her life, again while documenting her experience of this breakup. I think this book is a little self-indulgent, but it's completely aware of that. Um, it is very emotional, it is very sad, and yet the language is truly just astounding. Because it's told in these really short vignettes, it gives you like fragments of a life and fragments of poetry and kind of invites you to link it all together. And I just think that it's so smart and I think it is so well done and it's gorgeous. I'm gonna lump the next two books together because they are by the same author and that is Pablo Neruda. So first we have 20 Love Poems and A Song of Despair, which I also read in high school, and The Captain's Verses, which I read this year. A few things I love about Pablo Neruda, I think he is probably the best love poet I have ever read, and something I really, really appreciate um, about the way he is published is usually his poems are published um, with the Spanish on one side and the English on another, and my Spanish is not excellent. I took it for what, like seven years throughout schooling, and I really have not retained a lot, but I feel like I've retained enough that when I do scan the Spanish version, I can hear the flow and I can hear how beautiful it was in his original language. That has nothing to do with Pablo Neruda, because who knows how much of a say he had in the publication process, but I just really appreciate it because the flow translates in English, but I just I just appreciate but poetry is language. Um, poetry is meaning, but also poetry is the words you use. So to be able to actually witness the words as they were written, I love that. I think I vaguely prefer this to this, but it's also been years since I read this one, and I think my favorite Neruda poem is from this. It's called, what, If You Forget Me? Yeah, there's this poem in this called If You Forget Me, so if you don't want to pick up a full book, pay the money for that, you can at least check that poem out and uh, get your heart broken. So I keep my poetry books um, in a different shelf because my regular shelf does not have the room. There's actually one book I forgot to bring over from my bookshelf. Um, I've been doing this in alphabetical order, so I guess I might as well talk about this now, and that is Borderlands La Frontera by Gloria Anzaldúa. The reason I forgot to bring this over is because half of this book is just in prose. It is kind of theory and like personal nonfiction about her experience um, on the border of Mexico and the United States, and it's a lot- this book is about language. Rooted in her experience as a Chicana, a lesbian, an activist, and a writer, this essays and poems in this volume profoundly challenge and continue to challenge how we think about identity. Um, so yeah, it's like, it's, it's half prose, so I forgot to bring this over, but Gloria Enzaldúa is one of my favorite finds of, like, the past couple of years. Obviously, I knew in my head that, like, poetry is language, you know, poetry is so many things, but that, like, the actual words, you know, words have meaning, but words are also words and have sounds and have connotations, and I feel like the way she writes about language really, like, 
is, is the person who like turned me on to that. In the poetry part of this book, um, certain poems she has only in English, um, certain poems she has only in Spanish, certain poems are in English with Spanish words and there's kind of like a translation key, and certain poems she has in English with Spanish words and there's not a translation key. And the fact that I think that she like kind of plays with that, um, like makes you so aware of the fact that words aren't just their meanings. I don't know, it like this I feel like this really changed the way I see poetry and kind of all language. If you are a poet or are really interested in poetry, um, or even just like language, words from any kind of theory perspective, I cannot recommend this enough. It like really is one of the most like life-changing things I've read recently. Getting back to my stack of poetry, we have a book I have not read yet, and that is what New and Selected Poems by Mary Oliver. When I was at Barnes and Noble like a year ago, wanting to buy some poetry and I saw this Mary Oliver and I was like, this very large book is the same price as all these small books. I will buy this one, more Mary Oliver for the price. That, my friends, was a mistake for me personally. I'm just never gonna want to pick this up. I mean, that's not totally true. I'm gonna pick it up soon. But like, I think because of the length of other poetry books and also the fact that they are curated to be read, like they're, they're, they're thematically or somehow linked, like I'm just more apt to pick up that, something that feels like a complete picture where this just feels like a collection. I have heard only good things about Mary Oliver. If enough of you are like, no, shut the fuck up. You just need to start reading her. I will, and like, I want to read this, but I just made a mistake for me personally by buying this instead of anything else she's ever written. Up next on my shelf is this poetry book, um, which is a collection of poems that my boyfriend has written. Um, his mom put together kind of a collection of a lot of his stuff over the years for his birthday a few years back. He is the most talented person I have ever met, and I cannot wait to one day be able to talk to you about a Griffin Plagg collections of poems that you can go buy and feast on. But that day is not today, so I will just gush over these privately. <laughs> Up next we have Don't Let Me Be Lonely by Claudia Rankin. Um, her most popular book is this book called Citizen, um, but I read snippets of this for my very first writing class in college, um, Intro to Creative Writing, and like the passages we read moved me so much that I had to buy the full thing. This is one of the only poetry books that I have, and there are a few coming up, that I've read that I don't totally love. Um, this is about a lot of things. This is about um, like the post 9-11 world and technology and racism and also like the stuff that I remember. I feel like these snippets that we read in class were about like, I think her friend has cancer and is dying and there's like discussions on death. It's about a lot of stuff. I just didn't think it all came together perfectly. It's also been about six years since I've read this, so I could be full of shit. Um, but I'm really interested in some of her other work. I just can't completely wholeheartedly recommend this. Up next we have another book that I picked up because I liked someone's work so much in class that I went to buy one of their books, and that is Some Animal by Eli Shipley. We read uh, some of Eli Shipley's poems for that class on trans literature because he is a trans poet, um, and I was just so impressed by them that I wanted to like both support him and read more of his work. Um, and this book is very interesting. It's very much about the body in very scientific and personal ways. Um, there are like snippets from the DSM-5 in here and I feel like certain graphics, um, but ultimately it's also telling a very, very personal narrative, kind of in sometimes in verse, but also in like slightly more, oh shit, like slightly more prosy ways. I think from a pure enjoyment level, I liked some of his individual poems a little bit better than I like this collection, but I would ultimately recommend Eli Shipley. If you see his name come up anywhere and get a chance to read his stuff, I just would definitely recommend him. For probably my biggest hot take of this entire video, um, we have Crush by Richard Sykin that I don't really love. I think the whole internet is in love with Crush by Richard Sykin, and granted it's been a couple years since I reread this. I read this in high school, I reread it a few years ago, and now it's now. Um, and I found it a little self-indulgent in ways that I didn't quite vibe with. These are also very much love poems, obsessive love poems, kind of like heartbreak poems, and I like what they are going for. I just didn't think they always worked. This maybe more than anything else I own, I really think I owe a reread um, because I just remember having like bad feelings about it, but don't know how well I can articulate it. So I wouldn't necessarily not recommend this, but like it's on the lower, the lower end of the spectrum for me in my brain and I don't really know why. Another one I didn't really love, um, but can articulate a little bit better is Tender Buttons by Gertrude Stein. This is one of those pieces of art that I 
massively respect, but just at the end of the day, don't really enjoy. Tender Buttons is in three sections, objects, food, and rooms. I think a lot of stuff from objects is the most famous, and I actually did quite like objects. Um, but I think food and rooms kind of lost me. Tender Buttons, if for those of you who don't know, is an incredibly, incredibly experimental um, piece of poetry. Um, let's see if I can like read one of these that I especially liked. Oh, I feel like I remember a red stamp. If lilies are lily white, if they exhaust noise and distance and even dust, if they dusty will dirt a surface that has no extreme grace, if they do this and it is not necessary, it is not at all necessary, if they do this they need a catalogue. I'm not one of those people who thinks this is just nonsense, um, like there's nothing to gain out of this, however I do think the amount of work required to gain something out of this is a little bit more than I am willing to put in. Obviously for class, I read this for my Gertrude Stein class, I've put in a lot of work, um, but outside of the context of that class I just like don't see myself ever returning to this and while I have massive appreciation for Gertrude Stein, just not a huge actual fan. Next we have the poetry book I haven't read that I am most excited to read, and that is Patterson by William Carlos Williams. Few things about this. One, I have liked all the William Carlos Williams I've ever read. Two, my boyfriend loves this book and it kind of, I feel like, revitalized his love for writing poetry. Three, Patterson, directed by Jim Jarmusch, which is a film that is set in Patterson and has to do with poetry, like, was obviously clearly, like, incredibly inspired by this. Patterson is kind of a mix of prose and poetry that I feel like is very much, like, about place, about Patterson. Um, in, in its course of a city of Patterson, New Jersey, it becomes a, both a place and a man, a symbolic figure in which the personal and the public merge. Um, I'm just like very fascinated about this because it ha it's very long and it is poetry that has an overarching narrative which I'm just very interested in. Can't say much more, but I am very excited to get into this. Okay, I have a few more books to get into. Um, first off, I own Autobiography of Red by Anne Carson that I'm actually reading right now and it is in my car and I'm not gonna go down to my car and get it. But that is also like a narrative-based poetry book. I think it is kind of the poetization um, of this myth. I have heard incredibly, incredibly good things about that, um, and I actually bought it because we were going to read it for my Gertrude Stein class, but then, you know, we all know what happened um, in spring of 2020. My Our syllabus got messed up because the world got messed up. So I'm reading that right now, um, and I'm only like, 10, 15 pages in it, but I'm really enjoying it so far. I have this stack of small poems that I keep on my actual bookshelf, um, and two of the ones in that are Love Poems by Pablo Neruda and Wordsworth by, nope, this is Daffodils by Wordsworth, and I'm an idiot. I feel like these are books I'm gonna take with me, uh, like, the next time I have to go to the DMV or something. Uh, like, <laughs> not that, like, they're bad quality or anything, I'm just like, this is something nice to fit in your purse if you're gonna be somewhere and you think you might have to be there for a little bit and you want something to read. Um, I love Pablo Neruda, as discussed. I haven't read a ton of Wordsworth, um, but these are just small, cute little books that I haven't read yet. A book I know I own, but I think it might be in my boyfriend's office right now, is Night Sky with Exit Wounds by Ocean Vuong. Um, I wanted to specifically talk about this because I think this has the best sequencing of any poetry book I've ever read ever. This poetry has so much to do with family and with race, and I feel like the way Ocean Vuong tells his story, the way, he, yeah, literally, like, I know that sounds like maybe a simple part of a poetry book, and not every poetry book is specifically ordered, but the way his poems are ordered to tell his narrative, I just felt like was brilliant. I have not read his novel, um, On Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous, but I really, really want to read that, and Ocean Vuong is a name that is in the public eye and for good reason. And those are all the poetry books that I own. There are some others that I've read that I, like, I rented in college or that my boyfriend technically owns, but those are the ones that are in my collection or, like, scattered on my shelves that I own and have read or maybe haven't read. I hope this has given you some places to start if you haven't read poetry or some places to go if you had read, have read, and want to continue reading poetry. Um, I love poetry. I'm very passionate about it, about reading it and editing it, and yes, writing it even though the well is kind of dried up. I think this video accidentally got very long, so if you've watched the whole thing, thank you so much for watching, um, and you guys will see me in the next one.